Um, okay, so during that period, um, I began to reach out a bit more. I was traveling to the Center for Alternative Technology teaching courses, talking to people, and um, became identified um, as a possible consultant for developing world projects. Um, so I was recruited to design a wind turbine for local manufacturer in Zimbabwe in 97. And at that time, I was still building radial flux machines, basically brick drum machines. Um, it was a company called Paratronics in Harare who took up the uh, manufacture of the prototype. And, um, and it turned out to be successful, which is a bit of a fluke, really, because most wind turbine prototypes tend to go into all kinds of teething troubles and failures. So the company Paratronics felt inspired to actually set up a, a, a wind turbine manufacturing company called African Wind Power, modified the design in certain ways um, to make it more commercial. And uh, although it was the original concept was for rural electrification, they actually decided to um, and, um, get into the export market, uh, rands and dollars into the Zimbabwean economy, which was in terrible shape at the time. And um, actually, I imported quite a few of these machines to Scorrig, and they're still running to this day. Um, a lot of them have got locally manufactured wooden blades, and uh, uh, the tails all rusted and fell off, um, but it's easy enough to replace the tail. The alternators have been pretty solid, pretty sound on the whole, apart from the high voltage ones. Um, so African wind power could have been successful. I think they exported a lot of machines into the French market, and they were just breaking into the U.S. market. Um, when here are some examples of problems that occurred as a result of modifications to the design. Unfortunately, the fiberglass blades initially were much too weak. Simply making copies of the shape of wooden blades doesn't really work. You also need to have some sense of the structural properties. Here's one where all three wooden blades snapped off. All three fiberglass blades, I should say, snapped off um, due to inadequate strength. So it took a little while before the uh, company got to the point of being able to produce reliable fiberglass blades for high wind sites. But the worst problem was that in the American market they identified a need for slip rings. I've, I've never really been too keen on slip rings because they introduce extra cost and complexity into the turbine design, uh, extra um, things to go wrong. Um, I like wires dangling down the middle of the tower and simply untwisting them if necessary from time to time. But it turned out that for the US market, um, it wasn't really possible to stop people worrying about these wires twisting inside the tower. They would be constantly coming up with solutions and wondering about it and worrying about it. And although in most sites it's not actually a problem, it turned out to be a, a marketing issue that needed to be addressed. So African Wind Power designed some slip rings that you can see in the uh, the machine here um, on the right. Um, unfortunately, as part of that design, they weakened the yaw shaft and introduced a fatal stress concentration at the bottom of that shaft. They then shipped out a whole container load of these machines US um, to fail. Um, they lost the confidence and support of their US distributor and lost the US market and at that time, the Zimbabwean economy was going down the tubes, so really, at that point, um, African wind power ceased to be a successful commercial reality, which was a shame because um, it, it was really nice that a small company in a developing country could be exporting machines successfully into the U.S. and bringing in dollar currency in a reversal of the usual global market structure. Um, looking at the design of these alternators again, you can perhaps see the cast iron drum with magnets around the inside. I initially suggested using brake drums from local vehicles for this as being a low cost way to do it, but it turned out even if you had a vehicle in Zimbabwe, it was 
cheaper to get some guy down the road to cast you a new brake drum than to buy one that was manufactured in Europe or America or Japan. So it was by far cheaper to cast and machine a big cast iron drum to my space than it was for me to specify an alternator based on the parts, uh, the, the wheel or the brake drum of the truck. So that's what we did. Um, that, that part of it was simple. Making the laminated core for the stator, though, was a huge mission. Getting a punching machine that would punch the notches in those laminations precisely enough to actually line up so that we could fit the coils, um, that was a huge challenge, even for a company that was already manufacturing transformers and uh, UPS systems in Harare and Zimbabwe. So when we're talking about um, simplicity of design and local manufacture, making your own laminations is probably not the way to go. And, um, and I learned that lesson from that experience in Zimbabwe. There are other disadvantages with using a laminated core like this. I'll proceed to a review of the generator configurations. On the left, you can see the what's called radial flux design that I've been using in the 90s. And the magnetism passes across a fairly small air gap into a steel core, and the coils are wound in slots that uh, are in that steel core. This is a popular design for a lot of wind turbines, um, Berge and Whisper and uh, World Power Technologies. A lot of manufacturers in those days were using this sort of design. The main drawbacks are the difficulties of manufacturing those laminations. Um, but there are other drawbacks. Uh, the laminations themselves cause a fair bit of magnetic drag. There's quite a significant um, bit of uh, eddy currents and hysteresis loss in those laminations that make the machines harder to start. Basically, they, they eat into the low wind speed performance. And for me, good efficiencies in low wind speed is really the sacred uh, holy grail of small wind turbine manufacture for standalone operation where you're trying not to rely so much on batteries. So for these reasons, I went back to the axial flux design that you're probably more familiar with. Um, these are probably fairly um, uh, familiar pictures of the, the coils set in uh, a resin cord stator that, uh, that's positioned between two steel discs with magnets in them. The beauty of this being that a steel disc is quite easy to make in a small workshop. Um, the air gap is adjustable by jacking the magnets further apart to adjust the clearances or adjust the speed of the machine. The stator again is very easy to make because it's flat rather than being gluing, gluing coils onto a curved surface um, to a tight tolerance. Um, it was really a nightmare by comparison. So it was great to be able to progress to a design that was much, much easier for people to build, um, much more efficient in the wind speeds. And I've been using the axial flux design ever since. Um, as a slight uh, aside to that, there's a, there's a third possibility. This is an axial flux design that I became familiar with when I was working at Proven Wind Power, Scottish uh, Proven Energy, Scottish um, manufacturer of small wind turbines. Gordon Proden was a brilliant inventor. He chose, he didn't actually design it, but he chose the toroidal design, which may be of interest to some people. I think it's actually quite a, quite a suitable design. The, the stator, uh, which you can see in the bottom right, here's a picture of me winding one, winding the coils. You have to first put the wire onto a bobbin and then pass it through the, through the hole multiple times to wind the coil. And um, I'm going to try to sketch on here the shape of the coil. It's wound around uh, a steel core, passing the wire up through the hole and round the outside and down again, so that your coils are toroidally wound around a steel core. And that steel core would be between these two magnet rotors. Up here, you can see the magnets on one rotor. Now, the interesting thing with this is that it's, rather than being north and south opposite each other, as we would do. You would have two north poles opposite each other, and they would feed flux into the core, and then it would travel along the core and emerge again at the next magnet, um, which would be a south pole. 
instead of having magnetism crossing from, you basically have magnetism passing along the steel core, around the steel core from one magnet to the next, and that would keep alternating through these coils as the magnets progress. So it's effectively a flux concentrator. The steel core in the middle concentrates to so your wiring is relatively short in the coil. Um, there are some hysteresis losses, etc., but uh, fairly easy alternators to start. The core itself is fairly easy to make from a strip of laminate material wound around in a spiral and coated with epoxy before you wind the coils onto that. So um, quite an interesting configuration for alternator design for anyone who's not satisfied with the, with the radial or the axial flux designs that, that we've been looking at previously. And the ability to use ferrite magnets is great because, uh, because of the issues of corrosion with the more expensive and more vulnerable neodymium iron boron magnets that, um, that we mainly focused on over the last 10, 15 years. Again, around about the year 2000, um, after I had finished with um, the radial flux design, I, I happened to get a job with Intermediate Technology Development Group who wanted a, a simple design for small wind turbines um, that they were building in both uh, uh, Sri Lanka and Peru. And I traveled to both those countries um, and trained um, individual skilled uh, workshop guys in how to build these machines, and a handful of them were actually built. It's a little, little disappointing, the speed of dissemination of the design, but um, as part of that, I did get paid to write a, quite a detailed manual for constructing them, um, which is subsequently available for free on the, all over the internet. In fact, you'll find a lot of people selling this manual unscrupulously, but it is available as a free download um, on the internet. Uh, which has been quite a popular source of inspiration for people trying to build permanent magnet alternators over the years. In those days, as you can see, um, my idea for the stator was to build this sort of pudding bowl shaped thing um, where the back magnet rotor is actually concealed inside the bowl. Um, the idea being, I think, to get a, a better look shape, a stiffer shape as well for mounting the stator. Um, the downside is that you can't get at the back. You can't check the clearance at the back. So actually that stator shape was one of these design dead ends that, um, that tend to occur. What seemed like a good idea was actually just a waste of time. And uh, obviously I wouldn't build another stator like that again except as a, as a replacement part for one of these machines. There's still a couple of them working here. Um, but it's, uh, it's rather more difficult to build and completely unnecessary to make this pudding bowl shaped state. Um, the, the magnets in here are fairly widely spaced because magnets, even ferrite magnets in those days were quite expensive. Nowadays ferrite magnets are much, much cheaper. So nowadays I wouldn't actually build an alternator with the magnets so widely spaced. Um, with the ferrite magnets, I would tend to cram them together a lot more closely. Okay, so since uh, about the year 2000, I've actually been teaching quite a lot of courses. Um, I've stopped doing it now. There seem to be plenty of other people doing it, and uh, I'm not really comfortable with the amount of uh, gesturing around the planet it involves. Um, I also like living on Scarborough, but uh, between year 2000 and uh, a couple of years ago, I was te teaching quite a number of courses every year, and um, and that was fun, and uh, I learned a lot, and uh, I hope a lot of other people learned a lot from it as well. So that was largely done with design, which you can see in the recipe book um, that I created in the year 2008, um, and that's using neodymium magnets and wooden blades, and this basic uh, furling system. The main problem that has arisen over the years with this design, I would say for me, living in, um, living in a maritime climate with a lot of rain and uh, 
certain amount of um, stuff going wrong that causes damage and, and general issues is that the magnets themselves, the, the neodymium magnets, turned out not to be terribly robust. Um, the, I, I knew from experience that the ferrite magnets, um, they could fly off the machine, they could land in a ditch, you could fish them out weeks later, months later, and put them back on the machine and they would work fine, even though they were broken and abused. Neodymium magnets are not like that. They're um, actually very vulnerable to corrosion. They're protected by a coating, which, if you look after it really, really carefully, may, may survive. Obviously, embedding them in a resin casting should help as well. Um, I'd recommend nowadays that you put some kind of non steel disc, because I think often the coating on the magnets gets damaged by abrasion with the steel disc. Um, and I recommend um, embedding them really carefully and putting a layer of resin and, and uh, fiberglass on top of the magnet. Don't squeeze the resin dry on top of the magnet. Make sure it's really well protected because if that magnet rotor rub, rubs on the stator and the coating gets damaged or it gets damaged during assembly of the casting originally, sooner or later corrosion will start and that corrosion will cause the magnets to swell up and ultimately to rub on the stator and further damage. What I have found is that um, you can live with that damage just like you can with a rusty old car. You can paint the rust with oil um, rather than giving up immediately and replacing the magnet rotor, which is a pretty expensive component. I've learned that you can soak um, penetrating oil into the, into the rust. You can paint it with uh, linseed oil. You can cover the magnet rotor with grease and actually you can pretty much halt that corrosion process. So it's something that you can work with on a maintenance level um, if you manage to keep ahead of it. Uh, actually, you can get many, many years of successful operation out of a magnet rotor that's already started to corrode. But it also made me look back at ferrite technology. Ferrite magnets are a lot cheaper if you can buy them in sufficient numbers to overcome the, um, the rip-off of uh, markups and transport costs. Um, and they're so cheap uh, if you buy them in quantity that you can, as you can see on the right, you can cover your magnet rotor with magnet material um, and to an extent compensate for the lower flux density that you get with the ferrite magnet. Um, so I've been working on that design for a few years now and I finally managed to produce a publication that's an ebook and a, and a print publication called the 2F design. I, rather than using a whole range of different sizes, I decided to focus on a popular 2 meter diameter. Um, I'm also working on 3F and 4F uh, versions of this, um, which are available for anyone who's interested in uh, building prototypes. Um, what you'll notice most about the stator here is the completely different coil shape that I'm using. Rather than attempting to make a coil where all of the flux from the magnet passes through the center. When you've got magnets so crowded together, the whole geometry changes and it becomes preferable to have a fairly small triangular hole in the middle of the coil and have uh, pack a lot more copper into the stator that way. And this design has proved to be very successful actually and I can get very good efficiencies in spite of using the lower tech ferrite magnets. Um, so built a few of these uh, ferrite magnet machines and um, the, uh, the field coil trials that field <laughs> field trials that we've done thing um, using amateurs and, and loggers uh, have proved the efficiency to be equal to the uh, neodymium ones in practice. I think this is partly because in some cases the neodymium ones can be too efficient and still all the blades. It's very difficult to get a simple machine that has both good electrical efficiency and good blade efficiency because of the very different requirements for power speed curves that you get. So having a bit more loss in the electrons um, can actually enhance the blade performance. And so really having a super duper highly efficient, high field strength magnet isn't necessarily the way to go to get um, a cheap, easily built, reliable, and overall efficient machine. Um, just as well, ferret magnet turns out. 
the, the 2F design incidentally also uses a simpler construction technique that might be of interest. It's a bit tricky because it's it's rather different from the design of the recipe book and it's really a bad idea to try to teach people both designs. They get really, really confused. But I have been criticized for the uh, blade design having too many steps, being too complex, too involved, too many measurements, too time consuming. I mean, I can do it quickly. I think most people can learn to do it quickly. Um, to, to try to make the blade design process a bit quicker, I've been persuaded to try a technique where you create both the, uh, the drop and the thickness in a single carving process. And uh, to do that, you have to make all your measurements from the back of the piece, actually, so it ends up the correct thickness. And I've also reduced the number of stations, so as to simplify it. And so far, my experience with using this blade carving process is that it does seem to be simpler to do, and it does produce satisfactory results. So it's definitely worth looking at as an alternative for people who find the uh, blade carving prescription in the, um, in the recipe book too complex and involved and onerous. Here's a, a 3F machine that we built in Denmark in a course uh, actually last 2013 in the spring. And, um, and the, the three meter ferrite machine also works pretty well. You basically just go up one size in the magnet rotor compared to the neodymium design. You can use very much similar um, construction for the frame of the machine, for the blades, etc. Um, but, uh, but you need to, to use the these triangular coils, and um, yeah, uh, I would certainly recommend the ferrite magnets as a good way to go for building these sort of machines.